Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Archbishop Ralph Dennis coming on on time tonight. We were a little late last week, but we're on time tonight. Welcome in. Please like, tag, and share. Let the whole family of Apostolic Encounter know that we're on tonight. Hey, uh, Brother Larry Pearson, how are you, sir? Mother Dorothy Manning, bless you. Hey, Sharetta Barris, how are you? We all welcome in. Thank you for coming on so quickly tonight. This is Monday evening, March the 25th, here in uh, 2024. Hey there, Bish, uh, Overseer Burris, how are you, sir? Hey, Darlene, how are you? Thank you all for coming in. Hey, Miss Mary, how are you? Mother Burris, how are you, baby girl? Thanks for coming on. All oh, this short. Looking forward to seeing you sometime this week. Man, God bless you. Thank you. Hey, dear Mother Barnes. Enjoyed you yesterday. Glad to see you. Bless you. Hey, Linda Jones. How are you? Thank you for coming on tonight. I appreciate all of you coming on so quickly. Please like, tag, and share. Let your whole family, let all your friends, let all your relatives know we're here tonight. And we're certain to declare some things for the Lord here on Holy Week, during Holy Week. Bishop Hicks, how are you? Bless you. Mother Walker, bless you. Thank you. Bishop Washington, how are you? Thank you for coming on tonight. And Demetra, how are you? Dr. B, I heard you at church yesterday. I didn't see you. Bless you. Yeah, okay. I miss you. I miss you. I wish I had seen you. Bless you. Thank you for coming on tonight. Hopefully I'll see you maybe this weekend. I'm ministering in, in Columbia on Sunday, so maybe I'll be there. Hey, Mother Jackson, Mother Margaret Jackson, how are you? Mother Short, how are you, baby girl? Y'all do me a favor, like, tag, and share, like, tag, and share. We're going to have some great conversations tonight. I believe that we'll challenge our relationship with the Lord, challenge ourselves to grow deeper and come closer to him in this season in which we're living. I appreciate your coming on so quickly. And I ask that you just like, tag and share and let all your family, let your followers, let your friends know that we're on tonight. Hey, Elder Hale, how are you? Bless you, thank you for what you do. I, and you know what I'm talking about from time to time. I appreciate you so much. May God bless you real good. Hey, Steve Braxton, how are you, man? Pray that things are well with you. <clears throat> hey, we're going to get ready to pray very quickly tonight because uh, tonight's session is going to be quite extensive. I believe we got a lot that we need to talk about. Hey, Elder Allen, Elder Cynthia Allen, how are you? Bless you. Thank you for coming on. Hey, Ernie Scott. Hey, Stacy. Bless you. Hey, Arnetta. Thank Arnetta. Thank you for coming on tonight. We appreciate all of you. We're going to go ahead and pray and and uh, invite the Holy Spirit in. Hey, Anita, uh, because we got some things. Um, it's going to be quite lengthy, so I'm going to get a jump start on it tonight, just a little early. So pray with me if you will. Father, thank you for the blessings of another day that you allowed us to experience your presence, your power, your glory, even in the earth. Thank you for how you dwell with us. Thank you for how you abide with us. Thank you for fulfilling the promises that you made to us, that you would never leave us nor forsake us, but you'd be with us always, even unto the end. And Lord, thank you for that. Today, we can know we can count on you. After all that we go through, the things, Lord, that we experience, we are faithful. We know that you are faithful and we can count on you. I pray tonight, Lord, for special prayers for those who need a special touch from you. This is a season of much testing and trying. And yet, God, I know that you're able to do exceeding abundant above all that we're able to ask or to think according to the power that works in us. So I pray tonight, particularly for leaders, men and women of God, who are stretched, who, who Lord, are, are perplexed, who feel like throwing in the towel. I pray for them tonight that they won't give up, they won't give in, but they will press in. They will press in to know you better. Press in, Lord, to have a relationship with you that's stronger, mightier, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the way we take. And yet when we're tried, you said we shall come forth as pure gold. I believe your word. I stand on your promise tonight because they are yea and amen in you. And we bless you for them. And I pray tonight as we come together during this apostolic encounter, speak to us through the power of your word. Let us hear what it is that the spirit is saying unto the church. And as we hear your word, I pray that you make us not just hearers, but doers of your word. And Lord, make us your word. 
Make us that word. Make us your word. A living epistle to be read of men in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach us your way, O Lord, and lead us in the way everlasting. We'll give you glory, honor, praise, and thanksgiving for the same as we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You are strength and you are redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, Mother Rosie Johnson, how are you? Bless you. Mother Barbara Hardy, how are you? Bless you. Elder Lenore Taylor, how are you? Hey, Mother Doris Clifton, how are you? Thank you all for coming on tonight. My brother Wendell Chestnut, how are you, sir? Y'all like tag and share for me tonight. Please do that for me. Uh, that your family and your friends uh, know that we're on and we're going to be talking about some uh, interesting subjects tonight. And uh, hey, Michelle Freeman, look for you yesterday. How are you? Pray that you're doing well. My wife was asking me, had I heard from you? I pray that you're doing all right. Amen. May God bless each of you real good. And Kyle, how are you? Hey, Miss Lucille Dyson, how you doing? I pray that things are well with you as well. Listen, we're going to get started a little earlier tonight. And I hope you don't mind because I got a lot of things I want to cover. And I pray that God gives us the ability tonight to connect some dots. Bishop Kelvin Chouse, North Carolina's in the house. How are you, sir? Thank you for coming in tonight. I appreciate you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carlita Wall, how are you? Pastor Tim Shockley, thank you for coming on tonight. May God bless you. George Hawkins, how are you, sir? Marie, hey, how are you? Listen. Uh, I want you to do your best tonight to connect some dots of some things we're going to be talking about in the foreground here, uh, because there are things that are relative to our current day situations, what I call current events. But there are some things that we learn from current events, some applications we can make about current events. And um, I'm going to throw the first one out at you and see if you can handle it. Gas prices have gone higher. They're higher right now than they have been in over a year. And one of the contributing factors to the rise in gas prices during the spring of the year is what EPA has required of uh, companies that produce gas to formulate it differently during the summer than you do during the winter months. During the warm months, uh, one formula. During the cold months, another formula, uh, formula uh, is necessary. Summer grade gas has a, has a lower uh, volatility than winter grade gas uh, in order to limit vaporization uh, or vaporizing of emissions, I should say, that normally increase with warm weather and cause unhealthy uh, ground level ozone. So during the summer, the mixture is different. Refiners add something to the gas during the warm months that they can exclude during the cool months. I'm going somewhere with this so you can connect the dots. <laughs> Based upon what season is we're in, often determines what we need to mix with our normal uh, operating systems, with our normal beings, our normal prayer life, our normal word life. What else do we need to add when the weather changes, when the temperature changes, when things get tougher? What are some of the things we need to add to make sure that we don't become toxic, that we don't become uh, a death threat to others, but likewise that we ourselves are utterly sustained Woo, and protected and guarded. Oh my God, I just just think about that for a moment. Uh, I, I, I could go on from the scientific standpoint because that industry is the industry where I cut my teeth in corporate America and the gas and oil industry with Exxon. So I, I, I can talk about this for a moment, but I want you to think about it from a spiritual perspective. We all go through changes. We all go through life changes. And when life changes, how do we handle it? What do we do different? What do we add to our uh, daily regiment? What do we add to our pursuit of God to make sure that we become us uh, or we remain effective in our walk with God and do not draw back. I hope, hope that makes sense to you. And no, no real, no real uh, need for you to overthink it. It's just a, a parable, if you don't mind, that we can think about that we draw right off current events. Um, moving forward, 
I was impressed today that Kate Middleton, Princess Kate Middleton, uh, put out a video announcement that she was undergoing chemotherapy treatment for cancer. And of course, that that uh, video uh, shocked the world and global leaders immediately joined the royal family in expressing their support for her. Um, and spokesman later said that she and her husband, Prince William, are extremely moved by the public's warmth, the public support, the public's prayers, and et cetera. But what really got me was one of the uh, uh, editors for the Atlantic said the princess was bullied into this statement because the alternative, a wildfire of gossip and conspiracy theories was worse. So she had to come clean, come forth. No matter what uh, reason she did it, I just want to put out there that we need to, according to the Bible, learn how to pray for those who are in power, who are in authority. The Bible, that's a New Testament scripture that we must also apply. So let's let's keep her in prayer uh, as well. 137 people were killed last night uh, in Russia during one a Moscow or Moscow uh, concert venue. 137 people were killed, among those were three children. ISIS is taking the blame. They're saying that they were responsible for it. Um, Putin questions that. Some other people question that as well. Uh, the, here's the, the amazing thing. U.S. officials confirmed uh, the claim shortly afterward and also reported that they passed secret warnings to Russia earlier this month about this terrorist group and the terrorist plot to attack large crowds. Um, of course, Mr. Putin used that as a reason uh, to state that it was all American uh, initiated and it was part driven by American uh, uh, thought. So we have to keep praying. You Sometimes you can, can't even help your enemy because he doesn't always understand that though he is your enemy, you still have a pure heart. Uh, so Mr. Putin doesn't believe that about America, but that's, that's certainly up to him. Um, I'm going to move right off of this. There are a couple other things I would love to talk about, but uh, time is of the essence, and I need to go right to tonight uh, the heart of my thought and talking about the road that leads to the cross, the road to the cross uh, via Gethsemane. This is Holy Week that we're in and i uh, pray that hey bishop brock how are you hey peggy how are you andreas how are you son bless you man hey anthony bull how are you bless you rodney christian how are you sir bless you i i need to uh go right into that this lesson tonight um because i uh, have a very 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 full uh, itinerary this week but i want to exhaust myself in this tonight before it gets too late uh, this is Holy Week. This is week that leads up to uh, Jesus going to the cross. We had uh, Palm Sunday on yesterday. Many of you, I'm sure, received palms. Palms are uh, uh, indicators or symbolic of victory. Uh, I pray that you walk continually, perpetually in victory. Uh, that's the Lord's will concerning you, in, even in the midst of attack. It's the Lord's will that you continue to walk in victory. But I want to start tonight with a question, and I will see. Uh, hey, Portia Wheatley, how are you? I I want to see how many of you can um, put your re response real quick in the chat. I want. To, I don't know if I can see them all or not. But listen to this. This this is my question. I came up with earlier today. Um, and I want to just get your thoughts on it. Which do you think was worse for Jesus? His physical suffering or his emotional and mental suffering? Which do you think was worse for Jesus? His physical suffering or his emotional and mental suffering? Hey, Billy, how are you? Welcome back home. Bishop Chandler, thank you. Many tend to think the latter because rejection is a terrible thing to bear. And he must have been very hurt 
when everyone turned against him. But what do you think? What? Which one do you think? Okay, I see. I see a lot of emotional and mental. I see a lot of them. Rodney, Linda, Cynthia, uh, Ernest. Okay, I see a lot of emotional and mental. <laughs> Okay, that you you're blessing me. I'm glad you heard emotional, mental. Whoa, whoa! It's dominant. It's it's dominant. Not a single person so far have said, "Ooh, bar one." Oh, Elder Short, Elder Short is an exception to the rule. He said physical. Okay, I got one bold soldier who said, okay, Darlene says physical, okay. <laughs> Thank you for responding. I appreciate it so very much. Uh, I'm going to give you what I believe um, the, Bible, the Bible teaches us. Um, I'll give you a few scriptures, not an over uh, amount of them, because as I talk about the next portion of my subject tonight, which is the double battle of Gethsemane, the double battle of Gethsemane. Uh, thank you all for keeping them coming on in. I appreciate that so very much. Um, let me tell you what I think. Um, now this is going to shock you perhaps because I looked at all the responses. Jesus's physical pain was far greater than anything most of us will ever be called upon to endure. Stay, stay calm. <laughs> crucifixion was widely seen as the cruelest most cruel method of execution and his emotional i'm talking about what you saw now his emotional and mental suffering must have been just as intense so both were indeed intense let me try to jump off on one side of this hey faye how's my niece um the Bible says, Isaiah 53 and 3, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted or familiar with grief, or as some translation says, suffering. But listen to this and, 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 and hear your part. But, the, but far greater than either of these, both the mental and emotional and physical, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Far greater than either of these was Christ's spiritual suffering. <laughs> I, I know I didn't give you that one. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to test you for the most obvious ones, and that was emotional and mental versus physical. Most people do not relate to the fact that his spirit suffered also. We see his emotional, and we're going to talk a little bit about that emotional and physical tonight, but I want to talk just, just, just here in the intro, <laughs> uh, far greater than these two, the emotional, the mental, the physical, was Christ's spiritual suffering because all the sins of the world were placed on him. He endured punishment and he endured hell that we deserved he took on our spiritual load of sin and sinning oh my god he took it on for himself he took it on so <laughs> i i did throw you a curveball <laughs> and maybe this is not fair but i just wanted to give you the, see what your chalk treatment is the spiritual suffering spiritual suffering was indeed, I believe, the heavens of all his suffering. He was the divine son of God. All of us know that. We believe that. We teach that. We believe that with all our hearts. From all eternity, he had known nothing but unbroken fellowship with the Father. But on the cross, that fellowship was broken. On the cross, that fellowship, oh my shana, hey, glory. On the cross, he could no longer experience that relationship he had with the Father. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I hope you're hearing that because the spiritual relationship had been broken. More than emotional, more than the mental, more than the physical, 
his spiritual suffering was the heaviest of all. Uh, going, I hope you're hearing that. Connect these dots for your own life. Don't ever take lightly what it costs Jesus to purchase our salvation. Sometimes I think we take it too lightly. I really do. His, his physical and emotional suffering were only indicators of a far deeper and greater pain of suffering. The suffering of his soul for you and I. He was separated from his father. He was separated from his eternal being. Good God Almighty. <laughs> It, it, it distorted and changed everything about who he was up to that moment. I hope you're hearing me. Why did he do it? He did it for one reason, because he loves us. He loves us. We don't deserve it, but he loves us anyway. The Bible says this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. First John chapter four, verse 10. And, and today I'm asking you to please respond to his love by giving your life to him. I hope you will during this holy week. I hope you will. Let me back up just for a moment before I go to the meat of my, my lesson on tonight. And that is, what do you do what do you do when you come to a place called Gethsemane that leads to the cross and you can barely make it out of Gethsemane, let alone get to the cross? That's where we are in a lot of people today. A lot of individuals I know have been praying for, been praying with, um, been consulting with uh, when the pain of separation gets so great oh my god and sometimes it's because of the cause of carrying other people's burdens and situations we have to learn how to separate that that we have responsibility for from that which we do not have responsibility for very very essential maybe i get a chance to turn that corner and come back to there uh and maybe i won't but i hope you're connecting the dots now so back to our question, what was the greatest, Jesus' physical suffering or his emotional and mental suffering? Most of you say emotional and mental. No, there was no wrong answer. Few of you said physical, but I, I threw in that third option. It really was the spiritual separation, the spiritual separation, that spiritual moment of suffering when he was no longer in fellowship and relationship with the Father. If any of you have ever been in such a quagmire of life where you could not feel God, sense God, you believe that he had departed, you had reason to believe your fellowship was broken, you know without a doubt how painful that is. It is a place of no hope. It's a place of no hope at all. When that's gone, Life in itself is gone. Thank God he took that for us. He bore that in our stead. He suffered that so that we don't have to suffer that. He bore the pain and agony of hell, an eternal place of damnation, so that we won't have to. That's something to be thankful for. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for it. So keep that in mind. No, enough of that little icebreaker tonight. Um, we will all bear crosses as we move to everlasting life. You and I, each of us, will bear crosses. Not one, but multiple crosses. We will endure those crosses by the grace and the power and the strength of God. And my thought tonight, my desire tonight, is that even as we endure those crosses, we would not forget the object lessons we learn. As we move through the places where we have been led, that we will not give up. We will not give in. We will keep journeying forward with our hope in the Lord. 
I want to deal with tonight one of my uh, favorite texts. I love uh, the story of Gethsemane uh, in Matthew chapter 26. All the Gospels uh, seem to carry it uh, except for John. But and uh, I want to talk about that. Let's. I want to talk about the double battle of Gethsemane. The double battle in Gethsemane. And uh, if I was in a preaching moment, I, I would... I would probably use a subtopic like, Lord, teach us to fight. Lord, teach us to fight. Lord, teach us to fight. That's probably what I would talk about tonight. The text I want to focus on with you in this session is Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. I've preached it many, many times. Uh, something about that text that speaks to me about how real Jesus's experiences were, how natural they were, uh, how mental health cannot be overlooked, how our emotional health is something we gotta pay attention to because what Jesus went through showed us the reality of life when we get to this place called Gethsemane. It's the story of Jesus in Gethsemane, this Matthew 26, 36 through 46, the night before he died. He, the, the, the way it relates to the first message is that it describes the battle that Jesus fought on his way to making it possible for God to justify and turn the hearts of condemned traitors from death to life. It's a it's probably, to me, one of the most vivid stories in the Bible. And what I hope to show is that this story from the Garden of Gethsemane teaches us not only how Jesus fought his way to the cross, but how he set up the whole evening to show us how to join him in the fight. We uh, hope you're hearing that tonight because we all will must engage in the fight we must lord teach us to fight because in order for god to freely and to righteously justify and turn the hearts of condemned traitors from death to life and from satan to god and from blindness to seeing and from unbelief to faith not only did jesus have to die for sinners you got to hear this but he had to have he had, uh, but we have to take up our cross. We have to take up our cross and open our mouths and tell people what Christ has done for us, for them, because that's part of our stewardship of this particular narrative. God does not turn the hearts of rebels to himself apart from one, the death of Christ on the cross, and two, the word of God in our mouths seems quite simple, but listen to me and connect the dots. Christ had to purchase sinners. Christ had to purchase sinners. You got to hear me. Christ had to purchase sinners. We have to tell them when God turns the heart, faith happens. Faith comes to by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's John, I'm not John, um, Romans 10, Romans 10, 17. Christ must die. Jesus had to die. Christ had to be resurrected. Now we have a responsibility of speaking of what he has done, what he has completed. And this is how God turns hearts. This is how he gathers his people, no matter where they are in the world. And among all the peoples of the world, there must be an announcement of this trek to the cross, how Jesus got to the cross. That story just humbles me. Without the blood of Christ and the word of God, the Bible says nobody is born again. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 23, without the blood, without the word of God, nobody is saved. Nobody is born again. This is 
No hearts are turned from death to life without the word of God and without the blood of Jesus Christ. So in Gethsemane, let me get back together. Jesus was doing two things. He was fighting for the success of his death. Woo! Can you die successfully? He was fighting for the success of his death. That he would not be overcome by death, but death would be overcome by him. That's a major thing. When death is in warfare with you, how would the outcome be predicted? Would death overcome me or would I overcome death? So Jesus was fighting for the success of his death. Second thing I see there, he was showing how his followers must join him in the same fight. That's how his mission of turning hearts of men from death to life will succeed and how you and I will make an eternal difference in the world. I'm going to connect these dots for you as I go through this tonight. Let's move through this text. Wants to watch Jesus fight for his victory over death. Remember, I talked to you tonight. This this is a the double battle of Gethsemane. So we're going to move through this sort of twice, if you don't mind. Wants to watch Jesus fight for his own victory over death. And then the second time to watch how he draws us into the fight. Lord, teach us to fight. We are drawn into this fight. This fight is no longer just Jesus' fight. You and I likewise have now become part of the fight. I know this might be boring to some of you tonight, so y'all hang in there. This is Holy Week, and, and I could go through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and tell you what happened on the, each day, but you, you, can, you can get that yourself. I want to more deal with your spirit, man, and how you must keep him engaged engage like Jesus had to do during this week to make sure that the plan, the purpose, uh, uh, the destiny that you were called to does not get abandoned, does not get forsaken, but you will understand it enough to become committed to it. I hope you're, I hope you're understanding that. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, back to our text now, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. These are the words of Jesus. My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. He was battling emotional and mental torment. Yeah, I hope you're hearing me. So is emotional health real? Absolutely. Jesus can testify to it. This is not Christ now. Who? This is Jesus. This is the human factor. Could help me tonight. Good God, I feel this in my spirit. <laughs> he, yeah, yeah, not I. Because sometimes we also forget that we are, as much as we are trichotomy, we're also two natured beings. We have a human natural nature, but we also have a spiritual nature. We have a human man, but we also have a spirit man. And often the question becomes when we're in our own Gethsemane, what man is being reflected? Where are we at any peculiar or particular moment in the manifestation of who's in charge? Well, Jesus here in verse 38 of Matthew 26 says, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. I feel like I am dying. There is... Uh, much danger for his mission. He's in a dangerous place. It is possible to become so sad, so heavy, that reality is distorted. I, I, I know what I'm talking about. I'm dealing with some situations similar to that right now. I'm going to say it again. It's possible to become so sad, so heavy, that reality is distorted. The future seems hopeless. Actions seem impossible. You even ask yourself, why? Good God, help me tonight. I hope I'm helping somebody who's despondent. 
because this is real life. Perhaps you, you, you've been tested there. Perhaps you have. This is not small. Jesus' mission is in jeopardy. When he makes this statement, his mission is in jeopardy. He, he must fight against the uh, immobilizing effects of this horrible weight of sorrow. My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. He fights. He fights by crying out for help to his father in heaven. You've got to hear me. I hope some of you are getting this connecting the dots because some of you are going through what you're going through. You've got to follow this pattern of Gethsemane. That's why I'm teaching it. I'm, that's why I'm teaching it tonight. That, that this double meaning of, of, of Gethsemane on the Holy Week, on the real road to the cross, this is real. Some of us, some of you, some of, the, of your brothers and sisters in Christ have fought this fight. His fight was crying out. He, he fights by crying out to the Father for help. He's asking the Father in heaven for help. Matthew 26 and 39 says, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The cup would be all the horrors of the next 18 hours. The, the cup the bitterness, the darkness of the cup, the physical torture of the next 18 hours, the abandonment of his friends, part of the torture. You got to hear me tonight. Good God almighty. <laughs> the, the turning away of his father while he becomes sin for us. Listen to the torture. That's spiritual torture. That's not physical. It's not solely emotional and mental. It's, it's spiritual tearing. Good God away. My God, I feel him in here. <laughs> as, as, as the turning away of this father takes place, the pain of that rejection happens. He asked there, when you keep reading that, researching that, and get a, if you get a chance to do so, he asked that if there is any way to achieve God's purpose of salvation without drinking this cup. Is there any way to achieve my objective, the purpose, the destiny you assigned to me without drinking this cup? And if there is, he, he really, he was suggesting, then if there is, let this cup pass without my drinking it. But immediately, you got to hear this. I'm taking my time for a reason. He then submits and says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus' way of fighting against the first crushing sorrow is to ask that if possible, he would not have to drink the cup of agony. Oh, <laughs> your will be done. Your will be done. His ultimate acclamation. Now passing over to the, for the moment, his interaction with the disciples whom he found sleeping. And I need to put that in there because you need to hear some things. Let's go, let's go straight to Jesus' second time praying. We'll, we'll, go, we'll come back perhaps to that, that sleeping spirit. But let's go uh, to verse 42 for a quick moment. Something has happened that calls his prayer to be dramatically different this time in verse 42. Listen carefully what he says. Again, the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Your will be done. He was recognizing that there was no escape from destiny. Christ must die. Christ had to die. My God Almighty, his purpose had to be fulfilled. I'm grateful that Christ was able to take the agony of the fulfillment of destiny and the pain, the ultimate pain, away from those of us who now have surrendered our lives to him. And our pathway 
is no way near as brutal as it should have been, could have been, had not he bore the pain of suffering, the pain of suffering and separation from God that you and I, by right, should have been born it, bearing it for ourselves. And we don't have to ever experience it if we give our lives to him now in total consecration, in total commitment unto the Lord. I'm, I'm going to keep reading this because I think some of you are connecting the dot more and more. So let me keep going through what I outlined for tonight. In the first prayer, back in verse, in verse 39, the passing of the cup met not drinking it. Back in verse 39, the passing of the cup, you've got to hear me, these are important dots, met not drinking it. The second prayer in verse 42, the passing of the cup is by drinking it. Good God Almighty. I'm going to go through that again because I think some of you missed it. <laughs> in the first prayer, back in verse 39, the passing of the cup met not drinking it. But on the second time he prayed in verse 42, the passing of the cup is by drinking it. <laughs> if this cannot pass unless I drink it. In other words, Jesus did not go on praying that he would not have to drink the cup. He went on praying for success in drinking the cup. I feel God in here. There comes a time in your walk with God that you don't ask for removal of that which you're facing. You ask for grace to face it. I feel God in here. <laughs> Y'all excuse me. Ishu Baba Satai. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, God. He went on praying for success in drinking the cup. The battle lines shifted between the first and the second prayer. So sometimes you got to pray again. I know what you prayed the first time, but the second time the prayer is different. My God Almighty, the battle lines shifted between the first prayer and the second prayer. The first battle line was keep the cup of death and suffering from me if possible. That's the first one. That's the, that's the first battle line. Keep the cup of death and suffering away from me if possible. But then when he went back to pray the second time, the battle line was different. Now the battle line is, as I drink the cup, don't let me fail to do your will and accomplish your mission. I have now submitted to the drinking. I feel God in here. Boshi niyan satai. Korabai. Hallelujah. He das satai. He shabai. Grace to drink the cup, strength to drink the cup, obedience, willingness to drink the cup. My God Almighty is what he prayed for. So the battle lines change between the two prayers. That's why sometimes you just can't stop praying. After praying once, you got to go back and pray again because the next time you're going to build on the first prayer. So the second prayer is always stronger, mighty, closer to the will of God than the first prayer. Y'all, excuse me. I feel this in my spirit. This guy shall tie it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What happens? What happened? What happened in between these two prayers? There are two pointers. One's in the book of Luke and one is in Hebrews that I want to point out tonight. And I hope y'all hearing me. This, this is really a, 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 an apostolic Bible class tonight. So I hope you're hearing me. We're on our way to the cross. We're by way of Gethsemane. That's what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about the double battle in Gethsemane. And, and Lord, teach us to fight. Teach us to fight. Listen, here, 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 here are the, the, these two prayers. What happened in these two prayers? And here's the pointers. One is in Luke, one's in Hebrews. Luke 22 and 43. Luke 22 and 43. Hallelujah. Luke tells us that after Jesus' first prayer, there appeared to him an angel from heaven, <laughs> strengthening him. God, I feel like screaming. <laughs> Luke, Luke has this detail in here that Matthew does not include, but Luke 22 and 43 tells us 
that uh, after Jesus' first prayer, there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Strengthening him to do what? To drink the cup. <laughs> My son, there is no other way. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I can hear the Lord talking to him. I, I will uphold you with my right, righteous right hand. <laughs> so before his first battle of the Semini was done, the battle line had shifted from keep the cup from me to give me success in drinking it and to do your will and to finish my mission and to conquer death. Hallelujah. I, I, I wish I could handle you could handle a simple statement here because because when i look at this here the first there's something that rises up in my spirit it's three words saved from death <laughs> saved from death that's how we're saved we're saved from death let, let, let's keep looking at these pointers i told you one was in luke my eyes are blurry just from tears running here One's in Luke, the, I told you the other one's in Hebrews, Hebrews 5 and 7. The second pointer of what happened between Jesus' first and second prayer is found in Hebrews 5 and, second, uh, 5 and 7. Where the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. And he was heard because of his reverence. <laughs> That's the text. He cried out to be saved from death. God answered him. He saved him from death. <laughs> I'll see if you can connect those dots. See if you can understand why I said that. Because my statement is he did. Yes, he did. Yes, Jesus died. You've got to hear this. Yes, he died, but he was saved from death. <laughs> Hallelujah. Death did not destroy him. The fear of death did not destroy him. His obedience before death, nor his experience of death, destroyed his life after death. You got to hear that. You got to hear that. Let me say, say it to you again so you can connect the dots. Yes, he died. Yes, he died. He had to die. It was part of his mission to die. But he was saved from death. He died, but death did not have dominion over him. He died, but he was saved from death. Death did not destroy him. The fear of death did not destroy his obedience before death. Nor did the experience of death destroy his life after death. The sorrows of death were threatening to drive him off the path of obedience. Good God Almighty. And if he had been driven off the path of obedience, death would have won. Good God, I feel you in here tonight. <laughs> oh my, my. If, if those sorrows of death had succeeded, death would have been victorious even before he died. This is what his loud cries were about. This is why he screamed out to the father. Father, don't let this happen. My God, buddy. And, and, and God answered his prayers by sending an angel. I feel God sending an angel somewhere to somebody right now. God answers his prayer by sending an angel to strengthen his body, strengthen his mind, strengthen his heart so that the sorrows of death did not deter his obedience. I sent an angel to somebody who's in trouble tonight. Good God Almighty, to strengthen your heart, strengthen your mind, strengthen your body, so that the sorrows, even the sorrows of death, cannot deter your obedience. And he was saved from the power that death has to make us afraid to die. No longer are we fearful of death because now he has given us his victory over death. I hope y'all hearing that. 
I know it may sound a little complicated, but go back and play it, read it, play it, re uh, re rewind it, play it, do whatever you do, but you got to hear that. It's very important. So the first battle of Gethsemane, Jesus' battle, was fought in two phases, as I see it, as the battle lines shifted. Phase one, Jesus fought to be saved from death by escaping it, if possible, that that was God's will, if God would allow it. Then God sends an angel to strengthen Jesus. Eee, man, I feel angels moving. I feel angels moving. I feel angels moving. Somebody needs to receive strength right now. Ebo shatatai. Ekanai. Hallelujah. God sends an angel to strengthen him and clarifies once for all, the cup must be drunk. You've got to drink the cup. So a new battle line is now drawn. Good God Almighty. I'm going to strengthen you to drink the cup. So now we come to a new battle line. Here's phase two. Oh, God says I must drink the cup of death. Don't let the sorrows or the pain or the fear of death divert me from the path of my obedience. I'm praying a prayer for somebody now. If I've got to do this, don't let the pain, the sorrow, the agony, the disappointment divert me from the path of my obedience. Help me to be committed to obey. Listen to this, because I read somewhere in the Old Testament, my God, that obedience is even better than sacrifice. Ooh, my shatapai. Hallelujah. So God answered that prayer, which is why we are in the room. Uh, we are where we are here on uh, Facebook tonight, wherever you are, following the risen, the pattern of the risen Savior, following the pattern of Jesus. That's the first battle of Gethsemane. Now there's a battle for us to join Jesus. You got to hear me. That's the second battle I was talking about earlier tonight, the double battle of Gethsemane. Now there's a battle for us to join Jesus, a battle that we like to stay away from battle that we like to perhaps feel like is over exaggerated we want to talk more about the glorious victory and the triumphant uh, uh, dance that we have in the holy spirit what have you without facing the understanding that we too have a battle that we must face now move with me one more time through the battle of Gethsemane if you don't mind let me go back one more time only this time watch how he draws us into the same battle don't you forget I, I skipped some scriptures intentionally early on but when we go back this time i want you to watch how he draws us into the same battle sometimes we're so familiar with the bible uh, story that we don't pause to realize it might have been totally otherwise for example jesus might have come to gethsemane with the 11 disciples and told them all to sit and wait to be sure that he wasn't disturbed. And he goes 50 yards away out of earshot and returns just in time to meet Judas. It didn't happen that way. Why? It didn't happen that way. And why? Because Jesus didn't set it up that way. God did not, should maybe I should say God did not set it up the way. He intentionally set the scene up another way. And he did it for a reason. And they include you. They include me. So let's watch how he sets it up and then step back and draw out our lesson, the lesson that you and I are to learn. And here's some of what we skipped the first time. And that's the, the message here is watch and pray. Watch and pray. In Matthew 26 and 36, he tells eight of them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Uh -huh. And he takes it with him according uh, to Matthew 26 and 37, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Don't even get named anywhere in this text by the way only Peter 
why not uh, take all 11? You might ask the question, why not take all 11? Well, that's another lesson for another night with him so that they can all hear him fight the battle of Gethsemane. But he only took the three, what we call his inner circle, and then he only names one of them, where in other texts he names all three of them, Peter, James, and John. In this text, he only names Peter. And there's a reason why. Let's keep looking at that. I don't know except that what we learn later in Galatians 2 and 9, that Peter, James, and John were something like pillars in the early church. And perhaps pillars must be given uh, extraordinary training <laughs> on how to be strong. So maybe that, that that's, that's I'm sure that's, there's some biblical relativity there. So you connect the dots. To these three, Jesus said, remain here and watch for me. Verse 30, verse uh, 38. In other words, stay awake and be spiritually vigilant with me. Huge forces are at work tonight and you need to be awake and spiritual alert. That's that's my read and that's what I, I'm, I'm concluding from the message he gives them. <laughs> After the first phase of his battle, Jesus returns. Uh, and this is where you and I come in. This is a, this is, speaks to very clearly to your 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 need and mine. Jesus returns and finds Peter and the two sons of Zebedee sleeping in verse 40 of Matthew 26. They did not follow through in obedience. He was struggling with obedience, and they were failing in their obedience at the same time. You did not hear me. He's struggling with obedience, following the will of the Father. Good God Almighty. And here we are, and here we see uh, them failing in their obedience. And strikingly, Jesus addresses Peter directly. He does not address the three. He addresses Peter directly. He said, Peter, so could you not watch with me but one hour. So Peter alone gets named when Jesus picks three. And Peter alone gets named. Peter. <laughs> and, and, and Peter alone gets named when he rebukes the three in, in verse 40. So in verse 37 and verse 40, he rebukes Peter and does not name John, James and John. You got to hear that. So Peter's assignment is different. That's why when he listens them, although who went in the garden with him, he does not say Peter, James, and John. He says, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, whenever the Lord calls your name out and does not refer to you as part of a larger group, it's because your assignment is different. And some of us have been called by name. Some of you who are on here tonight have been called by name. And you're wondering why you cannot uh, be... Uh, a pigeonholed with the rest, or you cannot be categorized or or grouped with the rest. No, it's because you've been called by name. Your assignment is different. Your responsibility is different. The expectation he has of you is different. Listen to this. But likewise, the grace that's on your life is different. And woe unto us if we don't optimize that grace and take advantage of it and be found doing what the others are doing, sleeping. I hope you're hearing me. Woe unto us if we don't take that responsibility, the different responsibility we have and the grace we've been given to do it uh, and do something that the others have not been given responsibility for. If we just find ourselves doing what the masses do, then we are guilty. We are guilty of failure. Let, let, let's, let's keep looking at this. Let's keep looking at After the first phase of his battle, Jesus returned. He addresses Peter. Peter alone gets rebuked. Then Jesus gets more specific as to why their, listen to this, why their wakefulness and prayer are so crucial. This is where it comes to you and I. He gets more specific and why being awake and why them praying is so crucial even though Peter is named, the verbs in Greek are all second person plural, not singular. When you examine the text, the verbs 
in Greek are all second person plural, not singular. So when we get to Matthew 26 and 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. In other words, you are about to face the hardest temptation of your life in the next hours that are ahead of you. And you will be sucked into them and destroyed if you do not watch and pray. Because even though you have all said with, with your uh, valiant spirits, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. <laughs> Good God Almighty. Your weak flesh is more vulnerable than you think. And according to Matthew 26 and 43, when he came the second time, they were sleeping again. You got to hear this connection. We must learn to fight. We have a Gethsemane too. We were part of it. We were represented, represented there when Jesus went through it. Peter, James, and John are foreshadows of me and you. Those in our ministries, those who are part of our team, those who are supposed to be part of our vanguard, watching and praying with us. You got to learn something here. This was how they joined Jesus in the battle of Gethsemane. They slept through it. They simply slept through it. And we read the outcome in Matthew 26 and 56. Then all the disciples left him and fled. All of the disciples left him and fled. They were defeated at the battle of Gethsemane. All of the disciples were defeated at the battle of Gethsemane. I'm teaching this tonight so that we will not experience defeat at the battle of Gethsemane. The only reason there is a Christian church, a righteous church, a church of baptized believers, a New Testament church, a hope for Baltimore, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Atlanta, Miami, wherever you are, is that Jesus was not defeated in Gethsemane, but did exactly what he came to do. He laid down his life for those sheep that were straying and prayed for their faith, though it had failed, that it would not utterly fail. Come on, Luke picks it up in Luke 22 and 32. John talks about it in John 17, 11, John 17, and 15. All of these are, are scriptures that apply to this. My time is up. I got to go and let you go. But let, let me see if I can draw this to come, some real conclusion here. Jesus came the third time in Matthew 26, 45 through 36, and said, sleep and take your rest. Later on, you see, the hours is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, uh, let us go. See, my, my betrayer is in the hand. And those next few minutes, Jesus defeats the fear of death, and the disciples are overcome by it. He won the battle of Gethsemane. They lost it. I'm concluding this thing. I got a little bit more I need to share with you, but time won't allow me to do it. Each of us will have a battle of Gethsemane. Many of you are in the midst of the battle right now. The question becomes, will you win it or will you lose it? If you win it, what methodology do you employ to make sure you lose it? You win it, I should say. I think Christ gives us the method. Face the fact that you're human. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. But then yield to the strength, power, and the will of God in your life. And, and exercise obedience, which is even greater than the sacrifice you're about to make. Good God Almighty. Woo! Well, clearly this is a Bible story. I, I, I'm, I'm done. So that we can watch all of that and, and be ready for the battle of Gethsemane that's coming in our lives. That is, be ready to move with Jesus into his saving work. Be ready to join him in making the greater difference in the world. Learn to fight. Learn to fight through it. 
learn not to quit. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. His blood washes whiter than snow. I wish I had time to finish delineating this, but I, I'm committed to stewardship of our time the best we can. Go back and read this. Bishop Lloyd, how are you, sir? Thank you for coming on tonight. Go back, because there, there, there is so much to learn here, so much to grasp here as, as we see the double battle in Gethsemane. Jesus fighting one, his disciples fighting another. Good God. And we can see ourselves in both places, both places. My God Almighty. But tonight, can he trust you? Can he depend on you to do your part and making sure that salvation comes to the whole world? If your part was just to watch and to pray, will you perform that? If your part is to make the ultimate sacrifice, will you perform that? Each of us have a road to pray. Here's my, my, my thought I keep underlining tonight is, Lord, Teach us to fight. Teach us to be committed to your will. Teach us to be committed to your word, your way, the purpose for which you have called us. Help us not to draw back because of fear of doubt. Help us not to draw back even when men, those who came with us to the garden, go to sleep and forget that we're going through. Help us to trust you. Help us to rely on you. I speak tonight the strength of the angel that came to visit him in the midst of the two prayers. I speak the strength of the angel. May the power of the Lord strengthen you tonight, give you courage, hallelujah, give you tenacity, give you grace, give you anointing for the road that's ahead of you. Keep fighting the good fight of faith and lay hold to eternal life. No matter what you're feeling, there's a place where I believe God will give you grace through the strengthening of his angels when you can say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Don't give up. Don't give up. I am encountering too many key leaders in this season who feel like giving up, even to the extent that they are welcoming death if death would come. Don't give up. You are on the cusp of a major breakthrough right at the time that you feel like giving up. Please keep fighting the good fight of faith. Your inner circle may not always be there watching and praying, but God's got you and he'll send you an angel to strengthen you. I pray tonight that my voice has been the angel, the message of the angel, the messenger of God to strengthen you, to give you hope to give your life, even to give you your peace back, your joy back in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I speak strength now, particularly to those who become extremely weary, knowing, Lord, that they're on the cusp of a major breakthrough, but there seems to be darkness and death in the cup, and they're weary. Some, Lord, have lost the desire to even drink the cup, but send an angel from heaven to strengthen them now. And God, let the next prayer they pray not be one to avoid the cup, but grace and strength to drink the cup, knowing that by so doing, they will exercise power over death, hell and the grave through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank you for it. And we give you glory for the same. Now, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for coming on tonight. I know that was long. I know that was in depth. Probably not the way, right the way you would want to get the Friday <laughs> with the seven last say. But Gethsemane is a major lesson of, of a real life experience we all have in different contexts. But we all have one. And I want to make sure you don't miss it and quit in the midst of your Gethsemane you got to fight the good fight of faith. Thank you for your love and your contributions and your sharing from week to week, how you constantly give and share in this ministry. You have given us the impetus we need to keep moving forward. God is with us. God is with us now. 
So thank you for giving your, through your Cash App. Thank you for giving through your Zelle. Many of you give week after week, and I appreciate it so very much. Hey, Bishop Hyman, how are you? Bless you. May God bless you real good. Uh, thank you. I appreciate every dime you give. Little becomes much when it's placed in the master's hand. I've never asked you for a certain amount, um, and I, I appreciate all that you do. And God gives us wisdom of how to be good stewards of that which you have given so that it can be stretched, it can be multiplied, it can be used for somebody that without what you give, without what I'm able to give them and how I'm able to help them, they would not be able to abound or sometimes even thrive at all. Thank you. May the Lord bless you. Lord be willing. I'm off for Texas on tomorrow. Won't be back until Saturday. Um, Lord being willing, we'll see you on next Monday evening. That will be the first day of April. The first day of April. Uh, the day after Easter. The day after Easter. If you're in the Baltimore area, don't forget, proclaim at 6 a.m. at the Inner Harbor on the corner of Light and Pratt Street at the Amphitheater this coming Sunday morning at 6 a.m. Proclaim will be there, sponsored by Kingdom Worship Center, where we'll be the teaching and preaching of the word, um, community prayer, fellowship, worship in the presence of the risen Savior and those who will come. We're praying for souls to be saved, set free and delivered by the power of the Holy Ghost. And then we leave there and go to church. Uh, on Sunday morning, I'll be preaching in our Columbia location on this coming Sunday. May the grace of God be with you. May heaven smile upon you. Lord being willing, we'll be back with you next Monday, April the 1st, uh, at 7 o'clock here on Apostolic Encounter. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take it wherever you go. He loves you, and so do I. So do I. God bless. Good night. How are you, sir? Thank you. Thank you. I, I received that. Thank you so much. Bless you.